This morning we're going to be biting off a rather significant chunk of the uh, Gospel of John. Uh, as I told you, that it's dense with information, uh, certainly it is in this case as well, but because this is all one thing, there's one main point to it, I'm going to deal with verses 22 through 36. And uh, I would ask you to listen carefully as I read this. Um, the Lord doesn't speak any more plainly or any more clearly than when the Word of God is read. So we need to pay special attention to this and pray that uh, what we're going to hear following this will be a faithful exposition of what it is that the Lord actually is saying in this text. So John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. After these things, and of course it has to do with what Jesus had just, uh, his conversation with Nicodemus. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And people were coming and were being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now those of us here this morning who, who are believers, whose lives are wrapped up in Jesus, who are sincerely trying to follow his word, we, we do this because we love the Lord and because we really do want to honor him with our lives. And of course, when we see these things actively in our lives and we see ourselves doing these things, trusting Jesus, seeking to live for him, they do bring comfort to us because they show that we really do belong to him, that we really do have God's spirit in our hearts. Because apart from the spirit's work, uh, they wouldn't be there. It's the only way they can be. But sometimes we do lose sight of the level of affection and commitment that we should have to the Lord, uh, the level that he actually calls us to have. Uh, sometimes it's because we lose sight of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus really is worthy of, and how much then we should devote our lives to him. Now that happens frequently. It happens because we live in a world that is geared away from the Lord. It's actually Satan works very powerfully in this world continually to draw our attention, our mind, our affections away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we typically do lose sight, but when we do, passages like this can be very helpful because it reminds us of how one of the greatest servants that Jesus ever had was willing to do whatever he could to give glory and honor to his Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in our text, we see here a conversation between some of John's disciples and a Jew. 
that led John to discover that Jesus, uh, what he had been up to, as it were, since his baptism, how he was uh, making and baptizing even more disciples than he was. But far from finding this to be a threat to himself or to his ministry, he rejoiced that Jesus was receiving what rightfully belonged to him, that Jesus was being glorified. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is look at three things from this passage. First of all, to look at the context a bit that we find that Jesus and John are both baptizing. They're both making disciples. Uh, secondly, the disagreement that arose between John's disciples and a Jew over the question of purification. And then thirdly, and most importantly, the self-humbling or humiliation of John the Baptist, that Jesus must increase, he, he says, but I must decrease. Now, first of all, let's consider the context. After Jesus finished speaking to Nicodemus, he went out into the countryside of Judea with his disciples. And uh, we, I think from the text, we, we believe he went out there for at least three reasons. The first one was he wanted to spend time with his disciples. I mean, Jesus has just called them. His ministry has just begun. And he needed to train them. And certainly he was doing that. He went out into the wilderness to evangelize. Uh, to preach the gospel to as many people as he might find there. And of course, he went out thirdly to baptize those who repented and believed. We see in verse 22 of our text. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, that is at least in the countryside. There he was spending time with them and baptizing. You know, it's interesting, we don't often read about Jesus baptizing and sometimes, well actually, well, he wasn't baptizing himself as we're going to see. But sometimes we tend to think that Christian baptism didn't actually begin until Jesus gave his disciples the Great Commission. But that wasn't the case. Jesus was preaching throughout his ministry. Men and women were repenting and they were trusting in him. And those who did were baptized. They received Christian baptism. And uh, one thing I would like to note here is that baptism, whether it be of John or whether it be of Jesus, was a symbol of purification, that they had been washed, that they had been cleansed from their sins through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism represents, I think, most of all among other things. Now, as I said, we do want to note that Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were baptizing. We're going to read in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, where I also got the idea of uh, when John heard what Jesus was doing, that Jesus was actually making more disciples and baptizing more than John. We read, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. Now, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this question, but why is it that Jesus wasn't baptizing? Is it because he didn't want to get his hands wet? I mean, this is sort of a manner of speaking. No, it's because Jesus was not sent to baptize. Jesus was sent to preach the gospel and to gather together the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, by saying that, we're not saying that baptism isn't important. But what we're saying is that preaching the gospel is more important because that is how God saves people. Now Paul's going to say exactly the same thing regarding his own ministry in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 11 through 18. He says this, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other for Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel not in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. 
For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now we do see a couple of things here. We see first of all the problem of personality cults was already rearing its ugly head in the early church. We have that problem today as well, don't we? But as we're going to consider in a moment, it doesn't really matter which preacher of the gospel, which minister baptized you. It doesn't matter who the Lord used to lead you to faith. What really matters is who saved you. God saved you through His Son. And so He is to receive the glory and not man. Now passages like this also remind us that we are not saved by baptism. Jesus was not baptizing. Neither was Paul. What they were doing was preaching the gospel because that is what the Lord uses to save people. In Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so we see that Jesus was baptizing, or excuse me, Jesus wasn't baptizing. He was making converts. He was preaching the gospel. His disciples were baptizing, but he was doing that which is primary. He was preaching the gospel for the salvation of souls. Let me just encourage you. God makes the gospel powerful to save others. If you're talking to other people about Jesus, but you don't share the gospel, you're not giving them what it is they need in order to be saved. God works through the gospel. He makes that powerful. And so that is what we need to share. But I want you to know, secondly, that even though Jesus' ministry had begun, John's had not stopped. We read in verses 23 and 24. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, Anon is in the uh, Jordan River Valley, and it's so named because that area was full of springs. That's what the word Anon means, springs. But I want you to notice that John didn't retire. Why not? Was he trying to hold on to that uh, clout, to that recognition that he had had, to his popularity? Was he trying to compete with Jesus? No. He continued because he was still trying to do what he was sent out to do in the first place, which is to try to get people to follow Jesus. John's work wasn't done, even though Jesus was now on the scene. He continued to preach, but instead of, rep of preaching merely repentance, although that was still a part of his message, he was telling others to follow Jesus. He was continuing to point the way to them, or to him, and he continued to baptize those who were coming out to him and repenting, again as a sign to themselves and to others that they needed to be purified of their sins through faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, John continued to do that until God in his providence put a stop to it by Herod. Herod had him arrested. And we know that John didn't stop serving the Lord, didn't stop doing what the Lord called him to do until Herod executed him. Now that should serve as a reminder to us that we need to continue to love and serve the Lord until the very end, until we draw our last breath and the Lord takes us also to be home with him. So this is the context. Uh, Jesus is baptizing, John is baptizing, both of them are showing us our need to be purified of our sins through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, secondly, we see the disagreement that developed between John's disciples and a Jew in verse 25. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples and with a Jew about purification. Now, you know as well as I do, whenever you try to promote the truth, you're always going to run into those who don't agree with you. And that's what we find here. Now, perhaps this Jew decided to bring his complaint to John's disciples because John was too busy. Or maybe John was too unreachable. We don't really know. But there really is no mystery over what the Jew was upset about. And that is purification, the issue of purification. Now, I pointed out earlier that baptism is a symbol of purification. Purification. 
purification from sin, purification through the blood of Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, applying Christ to us, washing away our sins. That was true of Jesus' baptism, and I think it was also true of John's baptism. But when you introduce a new symbol of purification into a culture that already has symbols representing the same thing, you can run into disagreements. The author to the Hebrews reminds us that there are certain washings that were included in the Mosaic Law. There was a lot of ritual washings that all of them represented cleansing from sin. By the way, there was a lot of sprinkling of blood and application of blood that represented the same thing. And Jesus, on more than one occasion, rebuked the Pharisees for their traditional cleansings that they practiced while neglecting God's commandments. Now, the fact that both Jesus and John were baptizing, I think, in this Jew's mind, called into question the validity of the law of Moses and the tradition of the elders. Now, without going into any you know, much more detail regarding those traditions and the Mosaic law, let's just say this, that what the Mosaic law was pointing to by way of cleansing was now present in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be washed from your sins that Jesus was preaching and the way that John was preaching, the only true purification of which all those washings were pointing to was to turn from your sins and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the message that is behind baptism. That's what it tells us. That's what it teaches us. But it was during this debate with this Jew that the Jew brought something to their attention that they hadn't been aware of. That's something neither John nor his disciples knew, and that is that John, or excuse me, Jesus, was also baptizing. And when they heard it, they didn't know what to make of it. And so they came to John, not with questions about purification, are we doing the right thing, but with questions about Jesus, why is he baptizing? We read in verse 26, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the river, to whom you have testified, Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. I think we see in there a certain hint of jealousy on behalf of John. You know, they were his disciples. They were devoted to him. Is this man drawing attention away from, him, from you to himself? Is that right, John? Well, here's where we come to our final point. John's self-humbling, his self-humiliation. Instead of feeling slighted by this or threatened by what Jesus was doing, that Jesus' ministry was more effective than his own, that there were those who were listening to him and were being baptized by him, becoming his disciples, John was excited about Jesus' success, thrilled his heart. And he was excited for several reasons. First of all, because he knew this was from God. This was God's will. Listen to John's response in verse 27. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. There is a, there is a lot in, in that particular statement, which is why I would like to follow up on that tonight. But notice, first of all, John recognizes this as the hand of God. All these people wouldn't be coming to Jesus unless God was behind it, unless heaven was behind it. Remember, on one occasion, Gamaliel, when he was, uh, well, basically counseling the Jewish council what to do with regard to the apostles says this in Acts 5, 38 and 39. If this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. John saw the success that Jesus was having. He knew this came from heaven and he was delighted that God's plan to redeem mankind was unfolding before his eyes. Secondly, he was excited because of what this meant. What it meant was at least to some degree and by God's grace that his work, John's work, had been effective. He didn't come to point to himself, remember. He came to point to Jesus Christ. And now... Many were following Jesus. You see, John had been successful. He says in verse 28, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. John wasn't the Messiah. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. 
His job wasn't to draw attention to himself. His job was to draw attention to Jesus Christ and to get them ready for Messiah's coming. And now Jesus was there. Now the people were following him, which is what they should be doing. And that thrilled John. That made him happy. Thirdly, he was excited because the bridegroom had come. He says in verse 29, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Now John was basically two things. He was first of all the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. The, the bride is his church. John had come to draw attention to the bridegroom to tell others that they should stop sinning and that they should trust in this one who was coming in order that they might become part of the bride. And again, he was thrilled that the bridegroom had come and that he was gathering his sheep together, in this case his bride together. The people were listening and were following him. But he was also excited because the bridegroom is the redeemer and the bridegroom is his redeemer and he too is a part of the bride. That the one had come who loved him and who was going to lay down his life for him in order that he might have life. He was excited to hear the voice of the bridegroom who had come to gather him into the bride. Sometimes statements like this make us think that John wasn't part of the bride of Christ, but of course he is. All the redeemed from the very beginning to the very end, they're all a part of the bride of Christ. There's not two peoples of God, only one. And John is a part of that people, one of the sheep of the shepherd, one of the members of the bride of Christ. So John was excited that Jesus had come. He didn't feel slighted. He didn't feel threatened. This is the whole purpose of his life. But he was not only excited. Now that Jesus was here, he was also willing to step aside and let Jesus basically take over. He says, he must increase in verse 30, but I must decrease. Now John, of course, had had the time of his popularity he had captured the eyes and ears of all Israel. For the last six months, people had been coming out to him. People had been listening to him as he preached. And he had baptized many thousands. But now it was time for his ministry to diminish and for Jesus to increase. And he was happy to let that happen. Now, usually people don't like to give up popularity. People don't like to give up, you know, what, what they were laboring for. But you see, that wasn't what John was laboring for. He wasn't trying to get people to look at him. He was trying to get people to look at Jesus. So why was John happy now to let Jesus step into the light and for him to recede, as it were, out of the light? Well, because of what he understood about Jesus. And by the way, this is why we too should uh, see Jesus as precious and why we should love him and why we should seek to honor him. For one thing, John understood the value of what Jesus had to say, even as opposed to what he had to say. John knew that he himself was nothing more than a mere man. But I want you to notice he saw Jesus as what he really was and what he really is, God in our nature. He's the one who came from heaven. He was the one who was an eyewitness to the things he was talking about. He was the one that people should listen to because the one who comes from heaven, notice, is above all. I think this is a very clear statement, again, to the deity of Jesus Christ. Look at verses 31 and 32. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies. Now we do recognize that John was a great prophet. Jesus said of him in Matthew 11, 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. By the way, I don't think, this, this is the other passage we read where we get, tend to think that John was a part of another group of people. Isn't John in the kingdom of heaven? Is, is Jesus here saying that, that the least believer with the weakest faith is greater than John the Baptist because he's not in the kingdom? No, I think what Jesus is saying here is that he is greater than John 
He is the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven. He is the one who has humbled himself the most and become the servant of all. And he is greater than John. And that's what John is saying. Jesus is greater than I am. Now, there is no mere man that was greater than John, though there may have been equals, but Jesus was greater than John because he is God in our nature. John isn't saying here that what he preached was any less God's word than what Jesus was preaching, but we do need to recognize there's still a difference between God speaking through a man versus God coming himself in our nature and speaking to us in person. And that's what we see happening here. John needed to step aside and let the people listen to the God-man who had come to declare the things that he had seen. Now, sadly, John recognizes that there were those who wouldn't listen, again in verse 32. What he sees and hears, he bears witness to, but no one, he says, receives his testimony. It almost sounds absolute, but it isn't until we see verse 33 that there were those who did listen by God's grace and knew that what Jesus was saying was God's word. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Now, John may be speaking of himself here. He's undoubtedly, though, speaking about everyone who receives what Jesus has to say. They hear the voice of God speaking, and they accept it because it is God's word. So he was willing to step aside, we see, because of the value of what Jesus had to say. What he was saying was more important, as it were, in, at least in certain senses. Secondly, John was willing to step aside because Jesus had a greater anointing. And this is what, in a certain sense, and we don't have really the time to develop this idea, but this is what enabled Jesus the man to remember and to know what it is that he saw and what he heard while he was in heaven. In verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now we might be tempted to think that, that he giving the Spirit without measure is referring to Jesus, that he has the ability to give the Spirit of God without measure. And perhaps that's true, but he never actually did do that. I think what we see here is, is what is true of Jesus. The he here is the Father who has given to the Son the Spirit without measure or an unlimited anointing of the Spirit of God. And I think as well as Jonathan Edwards develops this thought, this is how he sees the union between the two natures, the divine and the human. It takes place in the Holy Spirit and the fact that he has given to Jesus the spirit without measure is what identifies that person who was in the human nature of Christ with the divine person, but also communicates something of that divine knowledge to the human nature of Jesus Christ so that he can remember things that took place in heaven before he came into the world. Jesus, John is saying, spoke with a power that was greater than his. His was limited even though he was at least as great as any of the other prophets. But Jesus spoke with an even greater power than his because he had the Spirit without measure. And so John was willing to step aside and let people listen to Jesus. Thirdly, John was willing to move aside because he, he understood, the, the, again, the worthiness of Jesus and how much the Father loved him and desired to, to honor him in verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. You know, John was certainly loved by the Father. He sent His Son into the world to die for Him. But the Father loved Jesus even more than John. And now was the time that the Father had chosen to bestow honor upon His Son and to draw attention to His Son while He was on the earth and of course, realizing that that honor and glory was going to continue with him, especially after his resurrection and throughout eternity. The one whom the Father loves most of all has now taken the stage. He's begun his ministry. So it was time for John to step aside and not try to take any of that attention away from him, but to continue to draw attention to him. Finally, John was willing to step aside because he understood Jesus is the Savior. Verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, 
but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, as we've already seen, John's purpose was to draw attention to Jesus because he was the one who was the, the, the one the Father loved most of all, but also because he was the only one who could save. John couldn't save them. Only Jesus could. There was no value in drawing attention to himself. He never did. He was always drawing attention to Jesus. And now that Jesus had come, he had a place to point, a person to point to. Go and listen to him. And so John, as it were, drives that point home with his disciples. Remember, this is a discussion he's having with his disciples by drawing their attention to that very point. Don't be concerned for me. Don't be concerned for my ministry. Don't look to me. Look to Jesus. Trust Him to save you. Obey Him and follow Him. Because it's only if you trust in Him and it's only if you obey Him and follow Him that you have passed from death to life, from judgment to salvation. Now clearly, Jesus was first in John's life. John put Him first. He loved Him most of all. Now John didn't just say that. John actually lived it because it was true in his life. Now, in closing, let's just simply apply that principle because it's really the simple principle. It's here. I've already applied all the others, so we'll apply this particular one. So let me ask you this question because this is the question the text is asking. Is Jesus first in your life as he was in John's life? Does Jesus thrill you the way that he thrilled John? Now, you know, there's a lot of things in this world that we get excited about. I mean, just watch people as they, you know, go throughout their lives, as they go to a sporting event. Ah, you know, they're screaming and yelling at what this team is doing, what that person is doing, how many baskets, how many touchdowns, and all this type of thing. We go to the theaters and we watch movies and we get thrilled about what the movie actors are doing or watch television and get thrilled about what these guys are doing or listen to somebody sing music and we get thrilled about that. And it captures our attention. It captures our hearts. And it's all that we can seem to think about. It's all that we seem to be able to talk about. Well, we all have our heroes, don't we? Who was John's hero? It was Jesus. Is he your hero? Is he the one you think about? Is he the one that thrills you? Is he the one you get excited about? Or is it something or someone else? Now, you need to realize what we read in the first commandment you shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? It means you shall love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. That he would be the center of your attention. That he would be your reason for living. He would be what thrills you. He would be your God. And nothing in this world. So is Jesus that to you? Is he the one that thrills you? Secondly, do you see Jesus as the reason for your existence? You know, John wasn't the only one he made. John wasn't the only one he put a particular calling on and sent to do something. He also made you. He also gave you gifts. The Lord also has a calling on your life. Now, John understood what his purpose was, and he found his purpose, his reason for living, and what God actually made him for, and that was to serve Jesus by going out and drawing attention to him. Is Jesus your reason for living? Is your purpose in life to serve him and to honor him and to draw attention to him? That was John's purpose. That is what the Lord wants you to do as well. Again, John is not unique in this way. He's just simply doing the particular thing God made him and called him to do. Well, he also made you. He also has a calling on your life. And that calling is to do the same thing that John did in his life, in his calling. It was to honor the Lord and draw attention to him. Thirdly, is his word precious to you as it was to John? Because again, here was one who came from heaven, God in human flesh, who was testifying of what he had seen and heard. Do you realize that Jesus put that information in a book for you so that you could read it and know? And if you want to know what that is, that's the only place you can really go. You're only going to find that information there. Jesus came down from heaven to tell you how you could be saved and to show you what kind of a life it is that you can live or you must live in order to please his Father. And as we've seen, he's certainly qualified to do this, not only because he's an eyewitness, but because he is the Son of God. Now, John urged others to listen to him. Is that what you're doing? Are you listening to Jesus? Jesus. 
Are you reading his word? Are you listening to it preached? To make sure that what you are doing with your lives, the way you are living, the decisions that you're making, really are what he wants you to do. Are you listening to Jesus? And then finally, is Jesus valuable to you? Remember John said that Jesus is the one the Father loves most of all. And he loves him because he is his very image. He is the one that, that the Father has determined to bestow honor on, not only in, in this world, but throughout eternity. Now John knew this, and he rejoiced that he could, at least in some way, know and serve Jesus because Jesus was precious to him as well. Remember the, the friend of the bridegroom hears his voice and he rejoices. Is Jesus valuable to you? Is he more valuable to you than these other things we talked about? Is he more valuable than the people of this world, than the things of this world, or the things that maybe would tempt you to place above him, friends, family? Sometimes we even put ourselves above Jesus Christ. Is Jesus better than that? Is he more worthy of your attention and your love than anything else in the world? Well, he certainly was to John. He certainly is to the Father. And that's the reason why the Lord redeemed you and opened your eyes is so you would see that beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and be drawn out to him as well because he is worthy. Now, I hope that these things are true of you because if they are, then you are a true believer because the Bible says that this is what will be true of a true believer. And again, we need to re recognize it's not going to be perfect in us. We're still going to stumble and fall in many ways. Sometimes there are going to be things that we do elevate above the Lord, but God's going to remind us and he's going to tear that idol down or at least bring about something in our lives that will cause us to knock that idol off its pedestal. We're not going to do it perfectly, but it is the desire of our hearts. So if you do have that desire, you do belong to him. But if these things are not the desire of your heart, then I urge you now to pray and seek the Lord for his mercy until Jesus is precious to you, until you are excited about Jesus, until you do see your whole purpose in living to be wrapped up in him, until you are willing to read his word, to see what it is he has to say and actually live according to that word. This is what it means to be born again. This is what it means to be a believer. Now don't forget John's closing words to his disciples in verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know, this almost doesn't sound right, does it? It almost sounds like you expect John to say, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe will not see life. But that's not what he says. He says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life because believing in Jesus Christ is more than just believing that the facts are true. It's trusting him to save you, but it's also being willing to listen to him, being willing to give up your life to follow him. Jesus says you have to pick up your crosses. You have to die to yourself, die to what you want out of this life, if it happens to be contrary to what he wants, and you begin to do what he wants you to do. Jesus says you have to lay your life down in order that you may pick it up again and live for him. Now again, there are many who believe themselves to be Christians, to believe themselves to be believers, to believe that they are sure of heaven because they believe the facts, because they believe these things are true, but they really don't want to follow him. They really don't want to obey him. They really don't want to read the Word of God and see what He says so that they know whether or not what they're doing is right. But notice again what John says in verse 36. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know, Jesus warns us in advance, and we all need to be warned by this, that many are going to come to Him on that final day. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, basically open the door to us. We were your disciples. We knew you. We loved you. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But 
he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord. It's not enough to believe that you're a Christian. It's not enough to believe the facts. It's not even enough, according to what Jesus says here, to be able to prophesy and cast out demons. There were people in, that lived in Jesus' day when those gifts were being given who actually did these things, but who never knew him. One uh, primary example would be Judas. He was numbered among the 12. He was sent out with the 12. He was sent out probably with the 70 as well. He cast out demons, he healed, he did all these miracles, and yet he didn't even know Jesus. He might be able to plead the same thing on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these wonderful things? And Jesus will say to him, I never knew you. Why? Well, it's because of the way he lived. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, will enter into heaven. Now, is Jesus preaching salvation by works? It almost sounds like it, doesn't it? But he's not. He's basically just telling us that if you truly believe in Jesus and you have the Spirit of God in your heart, that you're going to live a particular way. You're going to live according to the commandments of God. You're going to do what it is that God calls you to do. You're not going to be practicing lawlessness, as John tells us in 1 John, but you're going to be practicing righteousness because that is the desire of your heart and you're going to be reading God's word to find out what righteousness is and you're going to do what it says instead of what you think is right. So basically John is warning his disciples if you don't want to obey Jesus you do not belong to him and if this describes you this morning then you need to turn from your sins you need to trust Jesus and you need to begin to follow Him. You need to begin to obey Him and to do what He calls you to do because it's only those who obey Him that will see the kingdom of heaven and be welcomed by Jesus on the day of judgment. May the Lord grant that we would all truly believe and obey the Son. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask for God's grace uh, to do so.